Sounds great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm Brian Mielitz, an engineer on the SAM team uh, in, at NREL in Golden, Colorado. And we'll, yeah, we'll be talking about uh, batteries in SAM in the current version and specifically uh, with a focus on dispatch methods for behind the meter systems. So this is the uh, fourth webinar in our series this summer. Uh, we kick things off with an introduction to the current version of SAM. Uh, then four weeks ago, Paul did uh, a detailed dive into uh, bottling PV systems in uh, SAM. Two weeks ago, Doris handled a focus on battery technology, and recordings for all of those are currently available on YouTube. And then in two weeks, we'll have one final webinar in the series covering front of meter systems. You can register for free and view previous events at the link on this slide. And like previous webinars, this webinar will be recorded and posted to the SAM website. If you have questions during the presentation, uh, you can enter them into the questions box anytime. Uh, one of my colleagues will uh, either answer it right away or flag it as a question that we want to address the whole webinar at the end of the presentation. Uh, the interface for that might vary a little bit uh, based on what application you're on, but you can see examples on the slide. If this is your first SAM webinar, uh, SAM is free software that enables detailed performance and financial analysis for renewable energy systems. We use inputs such as weather data, system specifications, and system losses to generate a projection of electricity production, and then combine that with costs, compensation, financing, and incentives to get detailed techno-economic results such as annual, monthly, and hourly energy output, capacity factor, levelized cost of energy, net present value, payback, and revenue. The download link for the desktop version of SAM is at the bottom of this slide, and the code is also open source and available on GitHub. Here we summarize all of the technical performance and financial models that are available in SAM. During this webinar, we'll be focusing on the detailed photovoltaics model, the battery storage model, the generic system model, and the behind the meter financial models. As an overview of the whole webinar, we'll be looking at changes to the battery model since the previous version of SAM, giving an overview of all of the available dispatch modes, and then demoing three different systems uh, using behind the meter batteries, a residential system, a commercial system, and a couple of options with our generic system. So first, changes since the previous version of SAM. In SAM 2018.11.11, if you were trying to model a hybrid system with a battery, you would first select your performance model, and then on the left side, there would be the battery storage pane, and you would have the option to enable for the battery from there. In the current version of SAM, the technology selection menu has been modified to specifically elect uh, and enable battery and hybrid systems uh, straight from the outset. So there's this new battery storage option uh, in which you can select the detailed PV model with a battery, the simplified PV watts model with a battery, and the generic system with a battery. And then at that point, you select your financial models. If you do that, the battery storage page will already be filled out with all of the relevant inputs. And if you want to change uh, to a detailed PV or standalone PV model uh, with uh, the same inputs for the relevant fields, you can use this change model option from the model dropdown. So let's talk about what dispatch modes are available for uh, behind the meter batteries. Uh, I'll show, this is the screenshot of the dispatch page in SAM, and I'll show you where that is in just a second. Pull up SAM here. So this is the uh, welcome page of SAM. If we start a new project, and we'll do a detailed PV battery, distributed residential, and that'll be the first demo later, press OK. And then this comes up with the typical input options. And if we click on that battery storage page and scroll down a bit, we see where the dispatch options are available. So there's five different algorithms that are available in this version of SAM and several other input options that the relevance depends on which algorithm you've chosen. So the default for the residential model is manual dispatch. So all of these fields are lit up and clickable. If I change to, for example, input grid power targets, that manual dispatch field is grayed out. And now these charge options and this input field are now available. So if you think something you know, should be relevant to what you're trying to simulate, go ahead and change the dispatch option and that, that might enable that option. So 
So to summarize the five different dispatch options for behind the meter systems in the order that they are in uh, the, the SAM inputs, uh, we have peak shaving look ahead. This is an automated dispatch algorithm that uses as inputs uh, the upcoming system and load forecasts. And it's best used in systems where you're trying to uh, shave your uh, system grid peak uh, in order to uh, save money on peak demand charges. This algorithm can be a little bit uh, optimistic uh, because it uses perfect forecasts. The forecast that's provided to the peak shaving algorithm is the same as what's actually experienced by this uh, system for the next 24 hours. So to account for that, we also provide peak shaving look behind, which is the same algorithm, but it uses yesterday's actual PV and load as a forecast. So that provides a more conservative option uh, to get sort of a worst case estimate with a, a less accurate forecast. Input grid power targets also uses that same grid power target based algorithm, um, which we'll talk about more when we simulate the commercial system. And this allows the user to input uh, monthly or time series targets in case there is additional information uh, that the peak shaving algorithm might not be aware of, such as a, a tier or an interconnection limit. Next up is custom dispatch, uh, in which the user specifies a time series of what the battery should be doing at any given point. Uh, typically, we see this in front of the meter systems uh, when the modeler is trying to model ancillary services. But uh, in the behind the meter systems, this is most commonly used with our Python wrapper PySAM uh, when the modeler is trying to use some optimization algorithm that's not included in the SAM GUI package. And finally, there's manual dispatch uh, in which you specify a schedule by hour and month. And this is most commonly seen uh, where you're trying to model uh, an energy arbitrage use case for a time of use rate. So let's look at a residential system demo. Uh, in this demo, we're trying to demonstrate dispatch options suited to time of use rates for behind the meter storage connected to a PV system. So we already pulled up our PV battery residential system in the last step. Let's go ahead and use this drop-down menu to rename this to PV battery residential. And that way we'll keep track of it through all of our different uh, demos across the during the webinar. Um, some of these panes on the side were covered well in previous webinars. Uh, we'll do a little bit of PV sizing uh, during this webinar. But the first thing I'd like to do is set this up uh, our default system is for Phoenix, Arizona. So I'll show you how to change that to a different location, uh, specifically for this webinar, Golden, Colorado. So we do provide some uh, default weather files with SAM that you can use to learn some of the models. We also provide this download weather uh, file option where SAM connects to the National Solar Radiation Database in order to download a file. As Paul mentioned, uh, this is only going to work right now because I'm on the NREL VPN. Uh, we're going to get that issue resolved for everyone as soon as possible. Uh, but normally, under normal circumstances, uh, we can put the uh, zip code in here, 80401 for Golden. Uh, and then it will download a typical model year file and add that to the library if you click this button. So it communicates with the NSRDB. And it says that the file is already in the library. So uh, it, in some cases, this will download a new file. Since this was already in the library, it's going to highlight this PSM3 typical model year file. Uh, and now this has been set as the weather file for this model. The next thing I'm going to change in order to change the location is the electric load. Here we have an electric load that might be more typical for Phoenix. If I had a detailed building load profile, I could use this edit array option and paste in the hourly load profile into there. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of Sam's macros. Sam ships with a number of macros written in the LK scripting language that uh, automate common operations. Um, in particular, this download electric load macro uh, connects to NREL's OpenEI building load database and will automatically import a load to the electric load page. So if I click run macro, it will ask me if I want a residential or commercial load. So I'll choose residential. And then it gives me the option of base high and low. Had I chosen commercial, it would give me a wide array of building types that exist in that load database. So I'll go ahead and choose the base and it will download that from OpenEI. And then if we go back to the electric load page, we notice that the peak load is quite a bit lower. Uh, it was about you know, 4.5 before and now it's 2.7 and the annual energy has also dropped we can also use this view load data option 
to look at more detailed load data so that I can zoom in and see what's happening on any individual day. Um, and so we'll keep some of these numbers in mind as we, we plan the dispatch and sizing of our system. The final element uh, to move this system to Golden Colorado is updating the electricity rate. And so SAM comes with default rates and options, including how distributed generation is compensated, energy charges and dispatch charges. Uh, this schedule for the energy charges can be manually edited by highlighting these boxes and uh, pressing the numbers one through nine on your keyboard to specify time of use periods, this column, one through nine. And if you need up to 12 rates, A, B, and C correspond to the numbers 10, 11, and 12. There's also an additional option. Uh, if you're trying to model a rate in the US, we have a US electricity rates database on OpenEI. So I can click this search for rates button. This will communicate with OpenEI to generate a list of utility rates uh, or a list of utility companies that are in the database. I can then use this search by zip code again which will uh, generate a list of utilities relevant to 80401. So the Public Service Company of Colorado comes up. I can click that and then choose show active only. And what this does is it restricts the list that appears here to only those rates that are currently in effect. Um, I can also uh, potentially, if I was interested in a different rate schedule, choose this drop down and choose a commercial or lighting schedule. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to be using this residential energy time of use rate. So when I hit download and apply rate, it will download and apply that rate to the fixed monthly charge, the billing scheme, um, the buy and sell rates, and then this weekday and weekend schedule. And as we look at this rate, one thing that we're going to keep in mind for uh, the dispatch is that periods three and five are the highest cost periods. Um, and so that will matter when I am setting up my battery dispatch schedule on the battery storage page. So we go back to the battery storage page and reset to manual dispatch. Uh, we can see that this weekday and weekend schedule matches the original same utility rate schedule as a default. So these fields can also be edited with the keys on your keyboard, but do note that there are only six periods for battery dispatch. If I try to run the simulation with a seven, I get this error about how an invalid period has been specified. So if you have a period, or if you have a rate schedule with a lot of time of use rates, you may have to, or time of use periods, uh, you may have to get creative about combining periods on this page. So again, I could manually specify uh, those time of use periods on this page, but Sam also provides this copy schedules from time of use schedules. So if I press that button, the weekday and weekend schedule that we saw on the previous page is automatically copied onto my manual dispatch schedule. And then we said on the, pre, on the utility rates page that periods three and five were the highest cost periods. So we'll set up the battery to discharge during periods three and five and charge from the PV system in periods one, two, and four. There's also this option here for a percentage capacity. This is an upper limit of what percent of the battery's energy will be used in any given time step. Uh, so since the time of use period here is four hours, I'm just going to leave this at 25% uh, since that will allow the battery to cover the entire high cost period. So I can, since SAM provides defaults for a lot of these other settings, I can go ahead and hit simulate based on this new schedule and see basic performance for Golden Colorado. So we can get uh, on this summary page an estimate of annual energy, including this energy production chart by month, things like the battery round trip efficiency. Um, the manual dispatch schedule I specified had all of the charging uh, occurring from the system. So this battery charge energy from system is 100%. And uh, we estimate that this particular system would save $522 in the first year of the utility bill. However, this net present value is negative. So this implies that we might be investing too much capital cost uh, in order to generate the utility rate savings. So I'm going to demonstrate how to uh, resize the system uh, in order to generate a better return on the investment. So first, I'm going to decrease the size of the PV array. Um, and this makes sense, and this, I'm going to use this strategy uh, because the default system is sized for Phoenix. Uh, so because our electric load is smaller, we may want a smaller system in Golden, Colorado. So starting out with the PV array on the system design page, uh, we can see that the default system has seven modules per string in the subarray and two strings in parallel, 
with a nameplate capacity of 4.69 kilowatts DC. Uh, again, you can look at Paul's webinar from four weeks ago uh, on YouTube for a more detailed uh, way, uh, set of ways to use this page. But I'm going to use this simple estimate sum array one configuration button. And just by checking that box, it's decreased my desired array size to four kilowatts DC. So that's decreased the number of modules per string in the subarray and my nameplate DC capacity. But both this DC to AC ratio and nameplate DC capacity are lower than what I've specified in my inputs. And so that means um, that my inverter might not be paired well with my modules for this type of system. So I'm gonna change the inverter. Um, just doing some back of the envelope math, I know that about 3.3 kilowatts AC will produce my desired DC to AC ratio. So I can choose this nearby SMA America inverter. And then when I go back to the system design page, this estimate sum array one configuration option has already resized my system to four modules per string in the subarray and three strings in parallel. And now I have a nameplate DC capacity of 4.2 kilowatts and a DC to AC ratio of 1.22. I'm also going to resize the battery storage system. So I'm gonna go back to the battery storage page. And the battery sizing elements are right up here at the top. Uh, so since my peak load is around two kilowatts, I'm going to change my desired bank power to two kilowatts. And then since my time of use rate is about four hours, uh, I'm gonna have a four hour battery, which means an eight kilowatt hour system. So if we simulate the system with this resizing, we can see that those changes decreased our net capital costs and allowed for a positive net present value. Uh, two other things to look at in the residential system. First is uh, what if we were in a situation where we wanted to charge from the grid? Um, so let's see what happens if we change period one to grid charging. And in this case, our battery charge energy from system has gone down to 0% um, because we're now buying that electricity from the grid instead of using the electricity from our PV array, the net present value has gone back to negative. Um, and there's one other thing you have to watch out for, which is the uh, investment tax credit incentive. Um, so on this page, we specify a default 26% investment tax credit, and that's only valid when the system is above uh, 75%. Um, the, there's a set what's known as the 75% cliff on that investment tax credit. Um, so for the system I just simulated, which is charging from the grid 100% of the time, I would have to set this to zero. One other thing to show is this change model option. And typically uh, we recommend that you duplicate your model before changing the model. So I'll go ahead and do that uh, and then rename this to just PV residential. Oh, duplicate it again. There we go. Um, and then if I change my new model here to just a detailed PV model without the battery, we can see that that battery storage pane has disappeared but my system design here has remained and my electric load has remained. Um, and so if we simulate this, uh, we can see that the net savings with the utility rate, uh, net savings on the utility bill has gone down, but the net present value has gone up. So that's another system to examine. One note here is that all of these battery inputs that I specified on this page would not persist if I went and changed this model back to a PV plus battery system, they would be reverted to the defaults. So that's why we recommend duplicating the model. So are there any burning questions on residential models before we move on to the commercial model demonstration? I think we're good, Brian. Go ahead. All right. So for the commercial system, uh, we'll be talking about automated dispatch options for peak shaving um, and their relationship with peak demand charges. So if we go back to our SAM window here, we'll add a new model. Uh, again, battery storage, detailed PV, distributed commercial owner this time. And so we'll again rename this to uh, a PV battery commercial. And uh, one important difference between uh, the residential model and the commercial model uh, is in the default utility rate structure. So I'm just going to leave the default location as Phoenix for this one, uh, but it's important to note the uh, demand and time of use uh, demand charges for this system. So in the residential model, this was all zeroed out. In the commercial model, some of these demand charges are active. Um, so SAM provides two options for demand charges. 
Uh, one is what's known as the flat demand charge, which is specified by month and tier uh, in this default electricity rate that is zero. Um, and then there's also time of use demand charges, which can also specify a tier and a time when that's active. So we have one period um, that has one charge with a tier at 100 kilowatts and a second period that actually goes down in the charge after 100 kilowatts in period two. Um, so we'll keep that in mind as we're analyzing the system in the peak shaving algorithm. It's also worth getting a look at the electricity load default. Uh, so in this case, uh, the load is obviously a lot higher um, and our peak is 274 kilowatts during the year. So the first thing I'm going to do is again resize the battery um, just so we can see a little bit more uh, of the fidelity and the differences between these algorithms. Uh, so I'm going to set my desired bank capacity to 200 kilowatt hours and my desired bank power to 100 kilowatts. Um, so um, if we scroll down, uh, the default is set to peak shaving one day look ahead, which is the first algorithm we'll look at. Um, and then the battery is set up only to charge from the system. In this case, if you wanted to activate grid charging, you would check this box. Uh, but we're just going to leave this charging from the system for the demo. Um, so then if I hit simulate, uh, the simulation will run. And we can see, again, on the summary page, the annual energy. Uh, in this case, we're looking at $56,000 in year one of uh, utility rate savings. Um, and we can get a little bit more detail on where those savings are coming from um, by looking at the data tables page. There's a lot of different ways to look at SAMS data in these outputs up here. But on the data tables page, I'll look at the monthly data. And uh, right at the top, uh, because they're first alphabetically, are some of the uh, outputs that are relevant to the demand charges. So let's look at the time of use demand charges uh, with and without the system. Um, we know that the flat demand charge is going to be zero, and then we can also look at the demand peak. So this peak shaving algorithm is in some months uh, shaving you know, around 90 kilowatts uh, from the demand peak, uh, which is generating savings of four to $5,000 per month. Uh, so that, that's good. Uh, but one thing that I like to look at for um, these larger battery connected systems is how much uh, inverter clipping is happening, because it could be that we're losing energy from the PV system due to the inverter. So I'll look at the time series outputs and look at this uh, inverter clipping loss AC power. And so we can see that there is some clipping loss. So one way to deal with this is to go back to the battery storage page and change the model from an AC connected to a DC connected battery. Uh, an AC connected battery means that each system has its own inverter and that they're sharing power through the AC circuitry. Uh, a DC connected uh, battery means that the PV is able to charge the battery through DC circuitry, uh, which increases the efficiency, um, and then any power is sent to the AC circuitry through a shared inverter. Um, that shared inverter, uh, you can specify an efficiency cutoff if the battery is sending too little power. Um, you can cut that off. In this case, the default is 90%, um, but Sam has calculated that the nominal PV inverter efficiency will be 98%, um, so I shouldn't need to adjust this for the default inverter. So if I run this simulation for a DC connected system um, and go to the summary page, then we notice that the net savings of the, with the utility bill has gone up to $72,000 and we are shaving more energy uh, or more power from all of these peaks uh, corresponding to an increased savings in the time of use demand charges. Um, to go a little bit more into detail on what that algorithm is doing. Um, let's look at the time series output for the electricity grid power targets. So this is sort of the key to the three automated dispatch algorithms in SAM. Um, there's this grid power target that starts out lower at the beginning of each month, increases over the course of the month, and resets. And so this is telling the battery basically when to dispatch and when to charge on given days. For a little bit more detail on how that's calculated, um, it's computed every 24 hours in behind the meter system. It's based on the battery capacity. Um, the algorithm is targeting a full depth of discharge each day. It looks at the forecast of system energy, in this case from the PV array, and then also the load forecast for the building. So it will go through all of the time steps in the 24-hour forecast, um, subtract the load minus system to get the grid use, 
um, and then sort those hours, and then attempt to dispatch during the top n hours of grid use. So in the example on the right, we're dispatching during hours six, five, four, and seven, and charging during hours three, eight, two, and one. Um, and if you really want to get into detail on this, uh, there's a technical report from 2017 by Nick Diorio that explains this in great detail. Um, so generally, yeah, if the grid use is greater than the target, the battery will dispatch. If it's less than the target, charge. Um, the battery will not cycle if insufficient energy is available. And then the, uh, we attempt to maintain the uh, grid use target throughout the month uh, since there's no uh, value to be gained by shaving lower peaks. So to, to fill in some of those details, if we look at uh, electricity to load from battery, um, we can see the battery dispatch um, relative to the grid power target. And then this, uh, we can look at additional information here if we look at uh, the electricity to load from grid. Um, so zooming in on early July here, uh, we can see as the grid use climbs uh, throughout this first week, uh, the battery is attempting to meet these peaks. And then on July 8th and 9th, when the grid use is lower, the battery will not attempt to dispatch. And then on July 14th, um, we again shave that peak since it is close to our power target for that month. Um, other things that are worth looking at on the time series page are electricity to and from the battery. Uh, this especially paired with the battery state of charge um, gives you an idea of the power flows to and from the battery. Um, so we can see on um, this one that positive is discharging and the state of charge of the battery goes down and then negative is charging um, and we return the state of battery to the our state of charge um, to 95%. Um, other views can include in this case uh, looking at uh, the electricity to load from battery for discharging and the electricity to battery from system. Um, and so now both of these are, are positive and you can see the charge and discharge cycles this way. And finally, you can look at what is meeting the load at any given time by plotting, uh, in this case in blue, the electricity to load from battery, the electricity to load from grid, and the electricity to load from system. So the, the uh, PV system is red, grid power is orange, battery is blue. And if we scroll down here, we can look at the bill load um, and see, it actually might be more clear on this bottom graph, um, see that these three things sum to this bill load. Um, and yeah, that's that's a summary of the peak shaving look ahead algorithm. Uh, let's compare that to peak shaving look behind. So all I have to do is change this one radio button here. If it's simulate. So in this case, uh, we're seeing a little bit less battery use. I think there was there was battery use on July 5th in the previous uh, previous demonstration. Um, and if we look at the grid power targets, the grid power target at the end of the month is a little bit lower. Uh, similarly, these peak demands are a lot higher. Uh, in this case, you know, in, in July before we were seeing like 150 kilowatts, now we're seeing about 211. And there's a corresponding lack of savings in the demand charges. So as I mentioned before, this is a, um, you know, sort of a worst case forecast, uh, just so you can get sort of the upper and lower bounds of the performance. Uh, the next automated dispatch option is this input grid power targets. Um, so perhaps we want to specify um, the targets such that the system uh, doesn't hit that tier in the time of use utility rates. So there's a couple of different options here. I could specify individual targets for each month. I could also change this to time series power targets and specify hourly targets. Uh, in this case, I'm going to target uh, just trying not to go over that 100 kilowatt tier. So I can enter a single value here, press apply. Now every month has a 100 kilowatt target. Hit OK and simulate. And now uh, all the four months uh, are around that 100 kilowatts. So a few, in a few cases, we don't have the battery sized properly to, to keep it to 100 kilowatts across all of these months. But generally speaking, some of these months have come up and some of them have come down and closer to 100 kilowatts. And if we look at that, let's just look at the grid power target. Um, that is totally flat across the entire year. So that's what we specified uh, and that's what we would expect. 
Um, finally, let's look at the custom dispatch profile in case you got a profile you wanted to run. So when you input uh, battery power targets, it opens up this time series for battery power targets, and you can edit the array here, uh, again with negative uh, for charging and positive for discharging. All right, are there any burning questions on the commercial model before we move on to the generic system? Uh, nothing, nothing for the moment, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. So let's look at the generic system. Again, we're going to click into battery storage, generic system battery, and we'll do a residential financial model. And again, rename this so we can keep track. So the first thing you'll see here in the generic system is this power plant page. Um, this, as a default, is set up to model a thermal generator. Um, the two systems that I'll be modeling today um, are a wind generation profile and a standalone battery. So we provide some options here um, for either just doing a, a generic plant with a nameplate capacity and a capacity factor, and you can also import a sub-hourly or hourly generation profile. And that can be used in a couple of different cases. Um, today I'm going to use that uh, with a wind profile from SAM. Um, you could use it for an actual production profile from an installed system, or you could import a profile from another piece of software. Um, so one important note here, though, is because these default assumptions are for a thermal plant, uh, if you're going to do a renewable plant, uh, you have to change this heat rate to zero. So I'll go ahead and do that. Um, and then I will open up uh, a Excel file with a previously generated uh, wind profile from SAM. Uh, so here we have the hourly values for that wind plant. So I can then copy this column, go to edit array, paste that column in and press OK. And then uh, I wanna change the nameplate capacity to the capacity for that plant, which was 2.4 kilowatts. And since SAM already accounted for losses in the load profile, I can change the plant loss to zero. So then uh, everything is set up with defaults in the rest of the system. One thing to note is that since we don't have uh, the detailed clipping data for these uh, imported profiles, uh, you automatically have to connect to an AC battery. So that's something that's a little bit different. Um, but then the, the charge uh, and discharge options are the same as what we were looking at before. Um, I might change uh, because this default utility rate has a five hour uh, high priced um, period. I'll go ahead and change this down to 20%, uh, just so we're covering the entire time of use period. And then um, we'll discharge during period two because uh, we aren't expecting PV during that time. Um, and so uh, go ahead and hit simulate. And if we look at the time series data with the electricity to and from battery, um, and let's zoom in on a specific time here. Um, we're seeing charging in the middle of the night, right? So we know that this is not a PV profile because the sun usually isn't up at uh, four in the morning uh, in, in Colorado. Um, so that's an example of how to uh, use a profile from another renewable technology. Um, we can also look at um, a use the constant generation profile option um, in order to specify a standalone battery. Um, in this case, um, you'll want to set the capacity factor to zero. Um, note that the nameplate capacity has to be positive, otherwise that will cause a lot of not a number entries in the financial models. But to account for the fact that there is no nameplate capacity, go ahead and go to the system cost page and set the plant cost per capacity to zero dollars per watt. Um, so that removes that uh, generic plant. Um, and now we can see just the performance of the battery. But there's no system. Uh, so we cannot charge from system in our manual dispatch schedule. Uh, so we'll go ahead and allow the system to charge from grid during periods one and two and press simulate. And if we go to the summary page, uh, we can see that we're saving uh, $334 on the utility bill, uh, but there's a negative net present value. Um, and that's just the assumptions for this system. Uh, there's, you know, would be ways to uh, generate uh, a positive uh, net present value for this system. Uh, but one thing that's worth looking at here is there's these big negative spikes in the annual cash flow. Um, and these are battery replacements. So if you want um, a little bit 
this might not be as obvious uh, in other systems. Uh, so if you want a more robust way to look at these battery replacements, you can come over to the time series page and look at battery number of cycles and battery capacity relative to nameplate. And then as we zoom out, uh, the battery number of cycles will go up and the capacity relative to nameplate will go down until the capacity relative to nameplate hits 50%. And this is just one of the default assumptions in SAM. Uh, we assume a battery replacement when the capacity is at 50% of its nameplate. And uh, this is due to the cycling degradation of the battery. Um, so if you want to adjust that, you can go back to the battery storage page, come down to this battery replacements option down here. And you can see that default replace at specified capacity 50%. Uh, one option would be to replace on a specified schedule. You can specify that schedule either as an array, if you put a one in any of these values, the battery will be replaced in that year, uh, or you can specify a percent of the battery that you want to be replaced. And then there's also an option for no replacements. Maybe when, when your battery degrades its capacity sufficiently, you'll just you know, run with whatever is left of your, your PV system, for example. Uh, so let's have a look at that. So here the battery continues to degrade until it reaches 0% capacity in, in this year. I guess it's about 17 or 18. Um, so there's you know, a differences in that profile. Um, and if you want to you know, adjust any of the assumptions behind the battery lifetime, um, that option is here. And that was covered in more detail in Doris's webinar from two weeks ago. Um, so to finish things out, um, here is a slide with the links to some of the webinars I referenced. Um, the first one is Paul's webinar for uh, PV system design from two weeks ago. Um, then there's several webinars on uh, both battery model chemistry, lifetime details, and sizing on the battery videos page. Um, there's a lot more detail on the uh, residential and commercial financial models and some of the features with the load and utility rates uh, in a webinar on this financial models page. And then finally, um, the OpenAI utility rate database um, has a front end that allows you to search and compare rates, um, and that link uh, is available there. So thank you for your time, and any questions? Thanks, Brian. Um, <clears throat> there are a few questions. Um, there's, there's one that maybe we could address first um, about uh, where the where Sam reports the value of the um, the battery model, um, and I guess there's a few different ways to um, evaluate the value of the, of the stored energy. Um, but uh, so maybe you could address that and perhaps uh, quickly show the value of our E macro um, as part of that as well. Sure. Um, yeah, so so one option is, is what I showed earlier would be to compare the battery to a case without the battery. Um, and then um, for the, the value of RE system, uh, this is another macro um, that allows you to, you know, complete several runs and compare the results, uh, comparing, you know, no renewable system or a renewable system with no storage and a renewable system with storage. Um, so We've already set up uh, a system including storage. Um, and then um, let's assume that we have, in this case, um, the same, you have a couple of options for specifying your rate structure, uh, since oftentimes rate structures change when you install a renewable energy system. Um, so for the demo today, we'll just use the same time of use rates as we have um, on, let's do this on the residential system, uh, since. We have that, so value of RE system, same rates as PV. We go ahead and run that macro for the PV battery residential system. Well, is that still running in the, oh, that's still running in the background? Um, or do I need to put something in on the? Uh... Uh, the macro should, well, just uh, runs um, <clears throat> three different cases and it, it, it does it automatically and then it, it should generate that spreadsheet there. Uh, um, here we go. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, then this compares, um, the, the energy 
uh, total bill and net present value of the three different systems. So this would help quantify the difference um, between uh, the, the renewable energy only and renewable energy plus battery in this case. Great. Um, I think the remaining questions we've been able to um, to ask through the questions box. Um, I, if you'd like to ask another question um, by voice, um, feel free to raise your hand um, or let us know in the question box and we'll unmute your line so you can ask your question. It looks like uh, I thought somebody had raised their hand there for a minute, but they lowered it. So um, yeah, we still have a few minutes left for Q, for any questions. We'll, we'll just give folks some time to uh, to either type them or Not seeing any questions. Uh, we'll wait for a few minutes, but um, if there aren't any questions, we'll we'll go ahead and sign off early. But we'd love for you to take the opportunity to ask us questions about the webinar, or, or if you have any other questions about Sam, we could we could um, address those as well. Okay, it looks like Brian wants to uh, ask us a question, so let me. Sorry, Brian, a different Brian. Um, Okay, Brian Schmidley, uh, welcome. Yeah, hey Paul, it's good to hear from you. Thanks for the webinar. So, I, and again, it's been a long day. I probably haven't enough haven't had enough coffee. Uh, but I was trying to understand how to calculate uh, the, the 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 full number of 100% DOD, you know, cycles on a battery uh, when I'm modeling a hybrid system, a solar and battery storage system. So they're working together. And you know, if I go out, if I have a 15-minute time step file, and I go out to 35040 to see, okay, here's the end of the year. There's a total cycle count. Um, you know, is that reflecting a you know, is it reflecting the the total number of full 100% DoD um, cycles on that battery for warranty compliance purposes? Or I got the impression in the chat window that that's just counting the number of times I'm 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 I'm, I'm, you know, using the battery and doesn't really uh, reflect, uh, you know, the, the total 100% uh, DOD count from a cycle standpoint. And then you, and then someone answered, says you, you know, that, that um, basically you can calculate it by getting the, uh, it says here, um, you'd have to compute it via the absolute value of the electricity to and from the battery array, looking at the time step and the nominal capacity of the battery. So my question, I guess, uh, in summary is, how do I, in a hybrid system where I've got solar and battery, how do I find the absolute value of the electricity to and from just the battery itself to be able to calculate full DOD cycles in, in that year? Yeah, so you're you're correct that um, the the no battery number of cycles that I was showing in the time series pane is a, a partial cycle. So Sam uses rain flow counting to assign degradation for those cycles instead of the full depth of discharge that you're referencing. So in order okay. to get the number that you're looking for, uh, you'll want to come to the data tables page, go to lifetime hourly data, and then go to electricity to and from battery. And then this, uh, you can take this and uh, perform the absolute value function on it in order to get what you're looking for. Fantastic. Thank you. I couldn't find it. I was not able to find it in the data table. I was scrambling. So I'm glad you answered the question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. Um, and it looks like uh, I see another hand raised. Carlos, um, I'll unmute your line so you can ask your question. Welcome, Carlos. Yes. Yes, I was. You know, I, I was asking, good afternoon first. Uh, I was asking related to, you know, DC connected battery. I think it's, uh, you know, it's easy to, 
model the C connected battery in the DC side of the inverter. But what happens if you want to model, for example, a group of a group of inverter with a DC connected battery together with another group of inverter just I mean without battery, just connected to the grid. You know, it's a it's like a DC couple and an AC couple system at the same time. I don't know if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, Therese, do you have you thought about how to model that, or is that something we currently support? I I don't know how to do that off the top of my head. Yeah, you know, you have you have the DC battery, you know, a uh, DC couple connected at the input of a group of inverter. But if you want to to have a better, uh, if you want to have a better efficiency system. Sometimes you can connect also just a uh, uh, inverter without without battery to to just for the energy to be consumed during the day, you know, to get more efficiency, um, a more efficiency system, you know. So you have a DC connected battery with a group of inverter to store energy, but we all have another group better in the in the AC side without battery. I don't know if you got my idea. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, the current model in SAM only supports connecting the DC inverter to the PV system subarray one. Um, so I think if okay. you, um, I think if you had additional subarrays, those would might be close to what you're looking at. Um, but th that's that's about as close as we would get. Okay. Yeah, it might be worth following up with us on that um, to, so we can look at it in a little, little more carefully. Um, if you want to, you can email us at sam.support at nl.gov or post a question on the forum. We can, we, can, uh, we can take that conversation a little further. Um, all right. We have a question here from James. Um, any thoughts on how to handle a system that includes an electric vehicle component, such as vehicle to grid, which will become increasingly significant, especially for commercial fleets? Um, at this point, we don't have an explicit vehicle component in SAM. Um, SAM has been used for analysis involving uh, electric vehicles. Um, so I guess it's, it's certainly something we're aware of. Um, don't have immediate plans for adding such a component to um, to SAM, but I don't know, Doris, if you had any thoughts on on that. I know you've been involved in some of that analysis. Uh, Doris, I don't know if you're if you're speaking, you're muted. Thanks. Yes, I've been muted. This um, and yes, uh, so far in the analysis with electric vehicles, we've been treating them just as a extra load and not um, as something that I guess I guess when you're referring to a vehicle to grid, you mean like electricity going from the vehicle to the grid. Um, so yeah, we don't have a way to do that. Thanks, Therese. And it looks like uh, Carlos is, is uh, pointing out that PVSol, another piece of software, um, has an EV charging from solar component. Um, so it might be worth checking that. I'm not, not familiar with that myself. Let's see if there's any other questions coming through here. Um, we can wait a few minutes in case anyone else is formulating their question. Uh, 
Um, we have a whole series of, of battery webinars now on, on the SAM uh, website, Recordings of Past Webinars. Um, so if there's some component of the battery model that, that uh, we didn't cover in this webinar, uh, you might want to check out the, the link that Brian is showing there uh, to see if there's another video that, that, um, that, covers, that covers it. Um, So Carlos is just following up to say that the EV application, maybe you'd have two um, separate, like have separate battery, sets of batteries. Um, so there'd be a car battery system and a, and a, and a separate battery system as well. Okay, well, we do yeah, have... A, Paul, I, think, I don't think we oh, do that right, right now. No, we don't. Yeah. There are... We do have some workaround solutions for if you're trying to... Um, SAM doesn't really model hybrid power systems and where we define the hybrid... A hybrid power system is one that has more than one power source, you know, like a wind PV battery system. Uh, but there is a macro called the combined cases macro that allows you to combine the results of two different um, systems uh -huh. and use the output of the two systems in a single financial model. So it's not exactly a exactly. hybrid power system because it, the, the, they don't, uh, the systems can't interact with each other. But if you just sum that, sum the power generation profiles of, of the different systems, and feed that into the cash flow model uh that that can be useful for some applications and so you could potentially set up a a file with a case for your two different battery systems um and then and then use the combined cases macro to calculate the financial metrics ba based on those two cases okay All right, any other questions? <clears throat> um, which default load profiles are used for the commercial sector? So the um, the load profiles that uh, are available that when you download, use the the uh, load profile downloading macro there that, that Brian demonstrated, those come from a, uh, a Department of Energy database of load profiles that were generated for a set of standard uh, building types for either commercial or residential buildings. Um, and so when you download, when you use this macro, what it does is it gets the latitude and longitude from the weather file that's currently loaded on the location and resource page. And then it goes to that database and finds a, a load, pro, a pre-built load profile uh, for the closest location to your latitude and longitude, and then pulls that data into SAM. Uh, so uh, an important thing to n realize about that approach is that that DOE load data was built using a building energy model based on an older NSRDB uh, weather data set called the TMY3 data set. Um, so you're, you're gonna be downloading a load profile that's based on a different weather file than the one that you're using for your simulation. So that that is going to be an important consideration if you're doing demand charge uh, reduction modeling, where you want the load you want the load profile to match the solar resource. If you're modeling, for example, a building with air conditioning loads, you want the the peaks to happen during the high solar resource periods, um, so that those that coincidence won't be captured. Uh, when you use one of these load profiles because the the weather data that was used to generate the load profile is different than the weather data that you're using for your simulation um, you can look at on the on the macro page there you see there's links there to the databases themselves you can 
click those links to go to the database and read more about how uh, the, the data was generated. So we generally recommend these load profiles as a good starting point to get your analysis started, but, but we recommend that you try to find better quality data as you develop your, as your analysis moves into a more detailed phase. Okay, and there's a question here about a solar carport with battery. Um, so you could model a, a carport with battery system. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, you would just model the carport as an array. Um, so you'd use the, the PV model for that piece and then the, the battery model for your, uh, for the battery. So there shouldn't be any reason why you wouldn't be able to model a solar carport with battery in SAM. Okay, we just have a couple more minutes, so if you've got any last-minute thoughts or questions, let us know. Um, let's see, Carlos, did you raise, just raise your hand? I'll unmute you in case you just did. Um, did you have another question? Or it looks like you're self-muted, so. Uh, okay, great. Um, all right, well, if you do have any other questions for us, please feel free to uh, uh, get in touch with us. The best place to do that is on the SAM support forum on the SAM website, so sam.nrel.gov. There's a forum tab there. Um, you can also email us at sam.support.nrel.gov, and uh, we'd be happy to hear from you and, and uh, continue this conversation about battery storage or anything else about SAM. We also hold uh, a SAM roundtable once a month. Um, it's a 30-minute session where you can talk to us um, like this over a web, a go-to webinar session. So that'd be another way to get in touch with us. Um, otherwise, thank you, Brian, for a great uh, webinar. And thanks to everyone for participating. We uh, look forward to hearing from you soon. Um, and have a great, great day. Thank you.